Hey guys, how you doing? Chris from Mark back here again. Uh, now we're going to talk about medieval theater. It's our next worksheet. This is worksheet number four, medieval theater. And also the play Noah and his sons. Uh, follows the play, in the, I guess the follows the story of the Bible, Noah, um, but has a different twist on it. And definitely uh, keeps the medieval theater principles intact. Concept with this one. God's ordering of existence as told through the Bible. Also, another concept, you could say a sub-concept to this uh, lesson is how man spends his life on earth will determine how they spend eternity. This is what people believed back then. And the church, after what happened in Rome, things went that, went crazy. A little bit of background information. After the uh, fall of the Roman Empire, they were putting everything up on stage as it was. They were putting sex acts up on stage. All I mean, everything just kind of fell into debauchery. And the Catholic Church came in and said, time out, you guys can't do this anymore. Um, you guys are talking to God that we don't acknowledge. We acknowledge one and only God. Um, if you are an actor, if you're involved in theater, we don't want anything to do with you. So they separate themselves. So it's kind of ironic, in turn, that the Catholic Church used theater to get people to come back to church and to tell their stories and to promote theater, which is kind of cool. Um, so, God's ordering of existence is told through the Bible. Also, how man spends his time on earth determines how they will spend eternity. Very big. Um, talking about Christianity and the Catholic Church because at this point, these are medieval times, crazy times. You have kingdoms, you have people ransacking different villages and countries and stuff like that. Weren't even countries at that point. They were more principalities, kingdoms. Um, so the only stable government around was the Catholic Church. And they, you know, kind of ordered things a certain way and people would follow through with that. The morals taught by the Catholic Church and at this time, the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to quiz you with the Ten Commandments. Uh, I keep a list of them right here. Um, we're supposed to know them anyway. We all are as people, so they say. Um, the Ten Commandments. Um, also, another concept during this time is eternal life. And who has eternal life? God, Satan, and human souls. And that's where how you spend your time on earth determines where you spend eternity. Will it be with God? Or will it be with Satan? And heaven and hell was represented on the stage. On one side of the stage, you'd have God. On the other side of the stage, you'd have Satan. And then you have man here in the middle being pulled back and forth in between the two. If you're going to go to God, you make a choice and you go that way. If you're going to make another choice, you know, and go down the, the bad path, and you're going to go to Satan. Uh, and this was depicted literally on stage. The plays often examine you know, like I said, uh, what man did and the decisions they made that determined where they would spend their time. We have liturgical drama and liturgy, uh, very formal, and that was performed uh, within the church. Uh, and it was usually part of the church service. I mean, very minimal. Maybe four lines of sung dialogue at Christmas and at Easter. Um, that was it. Performed by the priests and altar boys because those are the ones up on um, the altar performing this. And also it was told in Latin because that was the language of the church in Western Europe during this time. And the reason we're focusing on Western Europe is because that's what we have here in the United States. Um, so, liturgical drama of the liturgy um, of the church. Part of the church service. Four lines of sung dialogue at Easter and Christmas. You get a little something extra there. Uh, performed by priests and altar boys because those are the ones who were up on the altar. And then told in Latin because it's the language of the church uh, at this time. And one um, person that we associate, another person that we associate with this, I should say, is Grosvita. She was a canoness at a nunnery in Gottesdienst, Germany. And she is known as the first credited female playwright. Um, and while she was a canonist at a nunnery, she ran the nunnery and she wrote um, plays. They don't know if they were performed during her lifetime, but uh, it depicted women differently than men had depicted um, women over the course, I guess, maybe the past 
1,000, 1,200 years up at this point um, because here you have a woman who's writing for, um, you know, from a feminine point of view, which is really kind of cool. So who is uh, Rosvita? She's a canonist at a nunnery, and she's the first credited female playwright. It's really, really cool. And that takes us into uh, vernacular drama. Vernacular um, means informal, of the location, of the place. And with vernacular, I, I haven't asked you a date, and I'm not going to, but just for frame of reference, we're looking at 1300 AD to 1500 AD. Plays moved outside of the church. It was a little more informal, if you will. It was performed in the colloquial language and um, the language of that place and time. Um, much, Many more people were familiar with um, this language. It was written in the native tongue. It was spoken, vernacular drama was spoken, not sung as it was in the liturgical. It was acted by laymen and by everyday people. And also it was financed by the community, not the church. Um, the church would say, you know, if you want to do your part, here's what you can do. You can perform this play for us, and that will help bring people into the church, and that is your obligation. But you will um, take all the expenses, and you will take the stories, and you will recruit for us, and you will celebrate for us. Um, three different types of plays we talk about during this time, during the vernacular drama. Passion plays, such as Noah and his sons. Um, these were plays about saints and the Old Testament. Mystery plays, plays about Jesus. Um, they were the most involved of the vernacular dramas. Um, they depicted the spiritual um, history of mankind. And then also we have morality or allegory plays, such as Everyman. Um, and these were plays testing the temptations of everyday men and women. Uh, people. All three of these plays, very melodramatic. The bad people were bad. The good people were good. And then, you know, if they would you know, fight or whatever, they'd have arguments, you know, people would be drawn to the dark side or to the positive, you know. And then the redemption would be even greater because they overcame this um, terrible temptation. Doing well on time. All right. Um, very quickly. This is not a history course, I guess it's not a uh, civics course, but we're gonna talk about the government this time and um, the feudal system was in place. What the feudal system was, you had uh, people who were uh, basically assigned a station in life. You had the feudal lords who were in charge of taking care of this plot of land and then they would divide those plots of land and you had people who would work that specific plot of land and then they had people on those plots of land who um, were destined to um, live that life and that was their job, their sole responsibility in life was to do that. And we had the decline of this system to where we had the rise of towns and cities. Um, people weren't being enslaved uh, anymore as workers. Um, we had people going off to edu get educated, go to uh, universities. Um, they would go and learn a craft from a uh, trade master. Um, and with that, we have uh, the creation of European countries. Countries, be uh, countries began to dwindle. Um, countries began to emerge. Uh, excuse me. Kingdoms began to dwindle. Countries began to emerge. Uh, people had an opinion on what they wanted to learn. They weren't, you know, going to be working this plot of land for the rest of their life. Now they can go learn a trade. And, you know, we have the, the rise, the beginning of a uh, middle class, almost, uh, if you will. Uh, we have the rise of ed industry. More people got educated and learned trades. Um, uh, we have, yeah, uh, more people. And also with that, we have more people in one central location going to where the jobs were. Um, we have trade guilds, uh, labor unions coming uh, at this time. You would start as an apprentice and you would work that job. You go in when you're 11 or 12, 13 years old and you would work as an apprentice for seven years. After seven years, you became a journeyman and you worked that for two to three years. And then after that, you became a master craftsman and then you would take uh, apprentices on your own. And with that hierarchy, um, you 
you have people coming to one central location to learn a trade. If you are a baker or a silversmith, a blacksmith, a shipwright, people who made ships, a uh, cooper, people who made barrels, all these different types of trades. And what people would do, all of the coopers would get together and they would elect one person to be the head of all of their unions. And you would go to like one part of the city or one part of the country to learn how to become a cooper or a cobbler or a tinker or this or that. And everyone who wanted to become one of those um, trade members, um, craftsmen I should say, um, would go to them and you would have people going different places to learn these things. And then the trade master, who was elected by all of the other craftsmen, um, ran basically organized that city what was going on and they became known as the town mayor and that's where we get kind of local government um, the hierarchy which we still follow today which is kind of crazy that is true also the trade guilds were responsible the church would say to them all right um, shipwrights we need you guys to uh, do a, do the play Noah and his sons because we need a boat so you guys can build a boat I want you guys to get together with you know the plumbers or whoever and you know get the water to fall on the stage so you've got that also um, we need somebody uh, the story of Jesus feeding 5,000 we need to get the uh, fishermen who were trade guild and then also um, the bakers as well so they can get the bread and the fish and then you had for the story of uh, Jesus's birth um, you get the goldsmith and then you get like you know all these different um, trade guilds together to help put on the play for uh, the church and that was their obligation. So the trade guild uh, was responsible in terms of theater. They're responsible for everything. The script, um, the actors, the set, um, the script, everything. So it all fell on them. Alright, so um, that will take us through trade guilds and uh, also they were also responsible for financing the production as well. So uh, I'm going to leave you there and then uh, we'll pick it up and uh, finish off the rest of this uh, worksheet. Thanks.